I am a reverend, and as a reverend, I strive to address the will of our merciful Father. But I am also a demographer, and being a demographer, I deal in numbers. I have developed a theory concerning how our planet works. Call it my gift to you. Agriculture is an activity cyclical in nature, and the power of man's effort to reproduce himself unrestrainedly is infinitely greater than the power of the earth to produce food. The poor must therefore always be with us, and a great many must starve. There you have it. And it's not my fault, so do please refrain from any primate urge to shoot the messenger. Nobody likes it when death knocks at their door. I, Thomas Robert Malthus, have merely done you the service of stating the obvious, that the demographics of our situation equal death. I love comparative advantage. We're on? Right. <clears throat> well, what we have today is quite different. But let me say something first, and I'm a fan, but let's be clear. Malthus's theory was consistently disproved from the very first moment that it went into print. And here's one reason why. Trade. If you can't produce enough to eat, then you buy from the neighbor who does. Now, the problem starts when the neighbor stops selling and you're still hungry. Today, we have enough food to feed the world. It's just it's become too expensive for a lot of people to buy. Take the example of Niger. 13 million people, big rice consumers, but they only produce enough rice for three months of the year. They have to import the rest. During the crisis, the price of rice rose by over 200%. This was due to exporting countries like India, Indonesia, who stopped exporting. However, economics is just one part of the whole. I think the uh, international community is now experiencing a triple crisis. Development, development emergency, where hundreds of hundred billion people are suffering from abject poverty and uh, pandemic diseases like HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis and global food crisis and most importantly climate change. These three triple crises are closely interconnected. Before this crisis hit, 850 million people were going to bed hungry every night. So this is not a new crisis. Um, it has worsened, so today we almost have a billion people who are going hungry to bed each night. If you don't eat, you're more tired. If you're more tired, you get sick. If you get sick, you die. There's, that's the direct relationship uh, in, in places where uh, the health systems are not you know, up to mark and, and where people are so weak to begin with that the smallest infection will, will kill them. In many developing countries, the households spend 60, 70 percent of their uh, budget on food. Um, the uh, fact that the prices of food have increased 100% uh, on international markets means that it is um, almost twice as expensive on uh, the shelves. And therefore, for the families impacted in this way, uh, it is a disaster. In fact, it might be interesting for reviewers to note what has happened to the price of all these food commodities in the last three months. You know, in the spring, everyone talked about the high food prices. In fact, that story held until the early summer. But since June and July, the price of most of these commodities, I'm talking grains and oil seeds, have fallen by 30 plus percent. The whole of human history um, is a history in which the overwhelming majority of people lived in the countryside and they produce their own food. 
And here we are at this world historical moment for the first time, over half the world's population live in cities. They don't produce food. They're dependent on someone else. What does this all mean? What is going on? Permanent, structural hunger. 850 million people will go hungry every year whether food prices are low or high. This recent crisis has added an additional 150 million newcomers to the scene who simply can no longer purchase enough to eat. Experts may argue various causes, but to me, the cause is singular, predictable, and, as stated, mathematical. Enfin, there are three reasons sur lesquelles la Banque mondiale, le Fonds monétaire international, la FAO, la Commission des droits de l'homme, tout le monde est d'accord, qui sont évidentes. C'est la spéculation, c'est les agrocarburants et c'est la politique absurde du Fonds monétaire international. The runaway increase in the price of wheat and rice in 2008 is partly due to diversion to biofuels, but in my view, mainly due to export restrictions put by exporting countries. In the case of wheat, about 40 countries put in various restrictions. All it would take was one small setback somewhere in the world, and what we'd have is soaring grain prices, and that's in fact what happened. There was a, a drought in Australia, not a big deal, but we had run down the inventories to the lowest level on record. So all these causes are interrelated. We are paying today the price of 20 years of mistaken policies, but the immediate causes are very clearly uh, agrofuels and speculation on international markets. Once something special for Sunday dinner, chicken, inspected and graded, is now thrifty every day. Yes, in one generation, people of this country have doubled their consumption of poultry. Alors, il y a beaucoup d'autres arguments que les Américains avancent. Euh, disant, ah oui, mais tout ça, c'est ni dû à la spéculation, ni dû au bioéthanol, c'est dû aux nouvelles habitudes alimentaires des classes moyennes chinoises, des classes moyennes indiennes. What you're seeing in China and India is that middle class people are consuming an awful lot more meat and dairy products. Now, the production of meat and dairy products requires an awful lot of grain. You can most certainly argue that changing diets in China and many other developing countries is a basic motivation behind the tightening of the grain supply. But that did not happen overnight, and China was mostly able to meet its own demand. However, if the Chinese decide to emulate the American dream, eat as many hamburgers, drive as many automobiles, then this picture could change radically. Last year I was in Beijing. It is a summer holiday. And when I, when I go to the supermarket, I found that all the prices are is rising. The, the, the assistants are, were changing, were changing the prices of the, of the, of the goods. I think uh, it, it is a big effect to all, to, all, uh, to all the Chinese people, and maybe in the world people, poor people uh, especially to poor people, they are getting, uh, they are getting more and more unhealthy, I think. Everything is transported on this planet. There is not a single item, if you find one, tell me. There is not a single item which is not transported. And 90% uh, or 80, 90% of the oil it's actually used for transportation. Avec le système d'agriculture intensive que l'on a développé dans beaucoup de pays du monde, eh bien le prix de l'aliment est directement lié au prix du pétrole parce que cet aliment dépend de l'utilisation de pesticides et d'engrais chimiques qui sont eux-mêmes à base de pétrole. Ah uh ah. -uh. You're heading for trouble. Pretty soon there won't be any oil left. I think it's going to end with everybody changing their, their habits. Just start working now, otherwise we won't have time. We're going to be out of oil within a few years. Indeed, some farmers were thusly inspired to go directly into the fuel business themselves. 
producing corn-based ethanol in the United States and rapeseed-based biofuels in Europe. Quite subsidized, quite profitable, and quite an ongoing problem. L'année dernière, en 2007, les États-Unis ont brûlé 138 millions de tonnes de maïs pour faire du carburant, pour remplir un réservoir d'une voiture qui fonctionne au bioéthanol, 50 litres, vous devez brûler 354 kilos de maïs. Avec 354 kilos de maïs, un enfant du Mexique ou de Zambie vit une année. Donc c'est un crime contre l'humanité. Maybe we need in a five, five years time something like 100 billion barrels per day. You, know? you need us four, five, six planets to <laughs> if you want to be to do bio, bio ethanol or bio whatever. <laughs> No, it's not going to work. The main problem with the agrofuels policy is the setting of mandates um, which prescribe that by 2020, 2022, we shall have to, uh, for example, have 10% of our transport working on the basis of renewable energies. The problem with these policies is that they give a signal to speculators that the price of land will continue to rise that the price of agricultural commodities will continue to rise, and therefore speculators can bet on the future rises in the prices. And this leads to a spiral uh, by which the prices on international markets go higher and higher, making food basically unaffordable for countries and unaffordable for small households who do not have the social safety nets which we have in our industrialized countries. Look, Brazil could produce so much ethanol with sugarcane uh, that they could shut down every corn ethanol plant. And that scares them. People like Barack Obama promised he wasn't gonna do that. Look, he comes from the second biggest corn producing state. He knows uh, where his lunch comes from. Anytime you're producing ethanol from grains of any kind, there are gonna be certain limitations compared to sugarcane, the Brazilian sugarcane ethanol. Uh, the efficiencies aren't as good. You do not have an obvious way to get the energy for conversion. You can take your corn, and convert it into ethanol, but you need an energy to do that conversion process. In the United States, it's probably mostly natural gas now that's used for that. Th th those kinds of constraints cause the efficiency and the CO2, the net CO2 reductions to be quite limited from grain-based ethanol. And the question now is not really starvation. It's really about agriculture in the center of our economic system. How do we make agriculture capable of responding to this growing demand? How do we make agriculture capable of responding to the fuel demand? Yeah? And this is one of the fundamental questions of our time. A hundred million tons of grain per year are being redirected from food to fuel. That is 5% of the total annual grain production. What this means is that it then becomes necessary to find substitutes for the missing corn, such as wheat, soy, or rice. The prices of these staples go up accordingly, thereby starving thousands. And what have we in return? A possible positive impact on climate change. <laughs>
vulnerable people. In, in the whole of history, we've seen huge movements of populations, societies, cultures, production systems on the basis of a few degrees change in temperature. If you look back over the last 100,000 100, years, etc., um, this is going to happen. And it's going to, the, the front line of this will be small farmers because they're more dependent on nature than anybody else, when you think about it. And they're usually occupying the most vulnerable zones. 